Someone once said, behind every great man stands a great woman. Who can testify to that statement? <laughs> <laughs> well, the statement, the statement is true in scripture. Abraham had his Sarah. Isaac had his Rachel. Samson had his Delilah. Ahab has his Jezebel. Well, okay, well, no, no, not, not all of those are actually perfect examples. <laughs> but Samuel, the first great prophet since Moses, had Hannah. But before we get into Hannah's story, I want us to start with the Gospel. Both the Gospel reading and the reading from Paul's letter of Hebrews speak about having confidence about not being alarmed by the signs of the end of our world, nor being fearful when it appears that we're about to meet God. And as I thought about this text this past week, I wondered why it was so important for Jesus and Paul to say these things. I wondered why it was so important and so much stress um, laid upon holding fast to our hope without wavering, upon encouraging one another when we see the day of the Lord approaching. The disciples at this point in the Gospel were not thinking about the end of the world, only the day of the Lord when in power and might they would take over and rule their local turf. Despite Jesus trying to warn them on on various occasions of it, what actually was going to come. It was Tuesday or Wednesday of Jesus' final week and his last visit to the temple. And Calvary was not on the agenda of the disciples' um, list. They had no fear. <coughs> Everything to them was getting closer to the reason as they saw it, that God had called them together. They had no fear right now, but we know how quickly that did change. Fear is something that we all face from time to time. I'm sure we know, all know times of fear. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of criticism, Fear of not being good enough? Is there any here who actually fears that life is pointless? Good. See, these kind of fears are very different from the physical fear that overwhelms us when, you know, with adrenaline, when a car swerves towards us on a highway. Some of us here have gone through the fears attached to losing your local church. The doors have closed and that holy ground has been upended. Yet the fact that you are here today shows that the church for you is much more than the comfort of bricks and mortar of familiarity. It's in the ongoing community and the fellowship together with our Holy Saviour that runs deep in your heart. Yesterday's terrorist attack on France brings the fear to many hearts and many nations. There were six separate attacks in public places filled with people. But it was interesting to note that our world leaders spoke encouragement to the people in terms of thoughts and prayers, of God being with those affected in France and in France in general. See, stunts like this do make us wonder, you know, where, where, when the end of the world is. And the end of the world, in some way, met at least 200 people yesterday. Now, if we have the means of destroying our world and perish the thought that we would ever do that, 
then how much more so God? The God who through the prophets spoke of it thousands of years ago. The God who through his son promised it and indeed warned us of it two millennium ago. But at the end of the day, the question of the season and the challenge of the weeks ahead is this. Are we ready? Our hope is that God will redeem the world. But the question is, how ready are we? Are we allowing the potter to form us his clay? Or are we thinking that the day of the Lord will never come? And as for meeting God face to face, I'm sure we all um, share a certain desire to avoid that any time soon. Yet at the same time, have an eagerness for it, a longing for it, that is based on a long-standing assurance that God will treat us mercifully and justly according to his love and his grace. And I'm sure we have all experienced this acceptance at the hands of others and the healing love of God in the people around us and the depths of our prayer and our meditations. <laughs> Yet, for the sake of others, both you and I are called to imagine the fear that dwells in the hearts of so many around us and to meet together and to encourage one another with what we have received. In our Samuel reading today, we learn about Hannah and how she faced her fear. It was Hannah's fear of being childless that brought her to persistent prayer with God. Her story may resonate with numerous women of our time too. Infertility is a widespread challenge that women face at times silently. Hannah's cultural context differs from ours significantly in that in ancient Israel, motherhood was the epitome of accomplishments for women. Not being able to conceive was seen as a sign of punishment from God. And nowadays, women of childbearing age in this country enjoy so much more. We have so many lifestyle choices that women in Hannah's day did not have. And the accomplishments that we can do are measured in a mass of areas. However, the stigma, misunderstanding, or lack of tact that women of today may experience could be seen just as insensitive and as cruel as in Hannah's day. There's much we can learn from Hannah's strength of character, her persistence, her resilience, and ability to manage her emotional roller coaster, even in the midst of peer group pressure, of nastiness, and of fear. Verse 7 tells us that she went to the house of the Lord each year and to pray and ask God just one thing to give her a child. Surely she must have started to wonder if God had heard her prayers or was he even able to answer this prayer after so many years? I mean, how many times have we just given up on God? Stopped asking never to see the fruit of answered prayer. We may be like sorrow-stricken but let us never give up on God, for he never gives up on us. Hannah's anguished prayers for her son spring from a very deep longing. And God intentionally created us with passions and with longings. But our longings can harden our hearts 
or turn us away from God and sometimes even make us appear crazy. Or they can propel us into the arms of the one who longs for us to return again and again with persistent prayer. In verse 15, Hannah explains to Eli, the priest, that she is not drunk or crazy, but full of anguish and grief. And he does not tell her to stop praying, but does remind her of persistent pleading. Cheer up. May the God of Israel grant the request you ask of him. In verse 17. And Eli reminds, reminds Hannah that she has not poured out her heart to a God made of wood, of metal, of stone, that is lifeless, but to a powerful and living God of Israel. And we can confidently leave our longings of our heart with our God. He is more reliable and powerful than anyone or anything else that we might think we can put our trust in. Persistent prayer thrives when we depend on the true and living God. And as a serious people of prayer, we too remember when God answers, either directly or subtly, publicly or privately, be it quickly or in God's timing. Perhaps in our time of waiting, waiting on God's answer, he is preparing us, strengthening us to use us in some way. But not all stories have a happy ending. And I'm sure each one of us has our own story that we wish, that we pray could have ended differently. But in the end, it's not about what the situation is. It's about how we handle that situation. And either how we are relying on God or not relying on God. Not all stories have a happy ending. But in this case, the Lord had compassion on Hannah and granted her the blessing of bearing a child. Samuel, who became a prominent figure in history and the history of the people of Israel. Paradoxically, when Hannah promised to uh, return to God that very same thing that she had asked for, Hannah prayed, Lord, if you will, I will. If you give me a child, I will give him to you for your service. People in a cry often a crisis often try to deal, uh, you know, make deals with God. I recall a movie with uh, Burt Reynolds years ago, and through, all throughout the movie he tried to kill himself. And at the end of the movie, he swam right out to the middle of the ocean as far as he could possibly go. And when he reached the point, he decided he didn't want to die. And he began swimming back to shore. And he started bargaining with God. I'll give you 75% of all I have if you get me back to shore. And he swam a little bit closer to shore. God, if you get me back to shore, you can have 40% of all I have. <laughs> and he swam a little bit more to shore. And finally he reached the shore and said, I am a man of my word. 20% of all I have is yours, God. <laughs> but can we actually bargain with God? I think not. And the Bible actually says don't even try. Promises are not so easy to keep. But when Hannah's much prayed for son is born, she does not forget the source of her great blessing. Her fear is gone. Her promise she kept. She is so thankful that she named him Samuel, which means ask of the Lord. And Samuel became the first great prophet since Moses. 
Behind every great man is a great woman. No wonder Hannah has been called the model mother of the Old Testament. Today's reading, today's readings all point to God's power and grace. And first Samuel 1 and 2, it is the outpouring of Hannah's heart to God and of what can happen when prayer is bursting with passion, perseverance and ultimately with praise. May your faith be strong and your confidence in God be a living hope today and always. Amen.